everybody. My name is Casey Wilms. I'm with the content platform engineering team at Netflix. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing with our new fledgling studio. Um, so around 2011, the content platform when we started, uh, our charter was to scale the operations behind Taking Titles Live. And you can think of Taking Titles Live as meaning uh, everything from ingesting assets from our partners, broadcasters, studios, uh, to adding tags, to adding ratings, and other types of core metadata. Uh, that's what we mean by saying scaling, taking titles live, uh, while keeping our, our eye on constantly improving the member experience. So that's how the content platform started. And if you go back and you look at uh, the first streaming interface for Netflix, um, I think it's, it's interesting that the metaphor for an interface back then was really uh, driven from the physical, uh, the physical um, selling of media. So when you would go into a market somewhere and you would see lines of, of DVD boxes on a shelf, that's really where this kind of interface is coming from. Uh, and if you step forward to today, it's actually a, a much different experience. Um, see if this video plays. Well, it's a fantastic video. If it played, it would be really sweet. Um, uh, but it's basically the interface of today uh, is very much different than it was in 2011. Today, you, you don't have this sort of physical metaphor for uh, a piece of content. Instead, you have a, a digital native experience where we're leveraging a lot of different types of artwork and motion, uh, motion assets in order to, to create a unique experience per customer. So we don't think of ourselves as being uh, one storefront. We think of ourselves as being 90 million storefronts, uh, a different storefront for every user. And so getting there, you can kind of track the evolution of, of the interface uh, as an evolution of the different assets that we manage and the processes that we manage on the content platform. And so uh, back in 2011, we had, again, that one sort of DVD box style of artwork. Uh, but today, we're actually uh, up to 13 different pieces of artwork uh, for our what we call licensed content. And that's what we get from our studio partners and our broadcasters. Um, and that's not just different types of images for different canvases and different devices. It's also different versions of images within, uh, within a single uh, image class. So uh, you see here the 1280 by 720, that's our horizontal artwork. We actually take about six of those, and they're differentiated versions, so that we can test those live on the site, and we can find the most meaningful image for uh, a given set of users and target those users with that image. So again, this is a, our way of creating a really impactful um, uh, interface that entices you to want to click play and watch that next piece of great content. Um, another process we also had to wrap our heads around as, as we sort of grew uh, was QC. Um, and so part of managing the member experience is making sure that you have really great, uh, really great quality translations and, and things like this are, are funny to look at, but it, it really takes you out of the experience of, of watching a great piece of content. Um, so we wanted to, to figure out how we could do a much better job of, of QC. And so when we started with QC, it was really a huge spreadsheet that people would go down and sort of track all the different titles that were going live, and then they would go and they would check the titles. Uh, then we, we added a system to sort of help scale that to multiple countries and multiple languages. And this is the first version of the system, which has some automated checks, which gives you sort of a thumbs up or a thumbs down if something is, uh, is good and, uh, or bad, if there's some programmatic issue we can find, like uh, um, frames that aren't playing or, or audio hits. Uh, and then we move into a tier one QC, which is spot check, and then a tier two, which is a verification round. And sort of this process allows us to uh, have a very reproducible way of doing QC at scale, but also it means we're QCing everything. Um, but because we are collecting all the data from all of our QC and now it's part of our system, what we're able to do is, is add a, a learning model into that, and that's what the PQC box here, predictive QC. And what that does is it takes our history of deliveries to Netflix, uh, and it essentially determines if something is likely to pass or fail based off of, of the attributes of that piece of content coming in. And if something is likely to pass, we'll just let it go straight onto site. If something is likely to fail, then of course we can go and we can check that asset with uh, manual QC. 
Uh, so this allows us to cut out about 20% of the volume of QC today, and I think it'll go to somewhere around 60% by the time we're finished training our models. Um, so the reason I, I bring this up is, is to say uh, that as we attack sort of um, the studio and, and building product for the studio, we think about it as collecting data is the most important thing that we do. So um, driving operations, scaling operations, of course the purpose is to take titles live on site and to deliver a great member experience, but we do that through the data that we gather because that data allows us to improve processes over time. Um, and so the, the thing that's changing for us over the last two years is um, we've had original since, uh, since I think Lillehammer was our first original in 2013. Uh, so we've had originals for a long time, but only in the last two years have we started actually producing our own originals. So we're in the process now of becoming a studio where we're responsible for productions uh, ourselves, and that means we're responsible for the tech stack. So the charter now for the content platform is to take titles live, but extend that all the way back to the camera. And that means we have to scale content creation while still delivering the best member experience. And so that's something we're grappling with. And we're hoping to sort of leverage our learnings from scaling the platform of Netflix to uh, scaling content creation. Um, and so these are some examples of, of the early, uh, what we call owned originals, but the originals that have come out of our own studio. Um, and so really for the rest of the talk, we're gonna be talking about um, sort of the production, production workflows. Uh, and so when you talk to people on production, one of the, the most common things that they talk about is putting every dollar on the screen. And that's sort of shorthand for, let's take the budget for this show, and let's put uh, all of the effort that we can to put that budget into things that the audience can experience. So let's cut out any, any, uh, any useless things and let's try to put every dollar on the screen. I mean something very, very different when you support millions and millions of screens like we do, uh, and when you're also uh, pushing forward in the industry with some of, of the latest technology. So uh, we'll have over, we have over 100 hours of HDR content live on our, our site right now. We just launched Iron Fist, which is uh, day one out of the gates with HDR. A lot of these features are brand new to creators and to the, the production crews that are creating them. So uh, our tools have to sort of help, uh, help bridge the gap towards these new, uh, these new types of technology. Um, it's also unique in the sense that we're, uh, we're not just the, the creator, we're also the exhibitor. So we're responsible not just for creating the content, but figuring out how we're gonna merchandise that content on site and how we're gonna advertise and market that content outside of the site. Uh, so all of this means that our interpretation of putting every dollar on the screen um, is, is constantly in flux and we're constantly learning. Uh, so um, really what we're talking about is, is the intersection between studio and product, product being the service and studio being the, the studio. Uh, and, and so we came up with a platform and we call it Content Hub. Um, but that platform is, is our sort of intersection between the studio and product. It's designed to be a central infrastructure for production um, while, while being a way that we're going to scale delivery of assets to product for uh, features like motion billboards, uh, localization, QC, things like that. And so some, some core challenges that we think about, um, how are we going to scale global production operations? Probably most important from all of these uh, for us and, and maybe the most unique for our team is figuring out what it means to improve or maintain the creative experience. So content platform you can think of as being sort of like an assembly line. And on an assembly line, your goal is to set up people on the right points on the line uh, and to make that as efficient and cost effective as possible. That's sort of the opposite goal for, for creativity. Your goal with creativity is not to make creativity hyper efficient. It's to make creativity free and as expressive as it can possibly be. So the last thing you wanna do is, is place gates around creativity by trying to make it hyper efficient. So this is sort of the opposite um, direction of how we've been thinking about building tools to date. Uh, so this is a brand new experience for us. Uh, someone mentioned, we, we said we're, we're doing 1,000 hours of originals this year. Uh, works out to roughly 400 titles. Um, and, and as we all know, scale changes assumptions. And so we have no idea what it means to, to make 400 titles a year in a single, 
a single studio, but we'll find out real quick. So I wanted to talk about some fundamentals that we think about, that we thought about, that were top of mind uh, as we started down this path. Um, so there's sort of two large buckets of fundamentals that we look at. One is uh, assets, and the other is operations. Um, so the, the first thing to, to take note of is, is an asset, a video, an audio asset coming from the camera or coming from sound. It evolves over time. So you start with a screenplay that uh, becomes clips. The clips are edited into a sequence. And then the sequence is mastered. VFX are added, color, you have sound. Uh, this is to say that an asset is generated. And once generated, it gets improved throughout uh, the life cycle, and if it makes the cut, then it continues to get improved until it goes live on site. So that's sort of one of the core fundamentals. Uh, some of the other fundamentals, uh, up to 1.2 petabytes of storage are needed per show. Camera files are gigantic. It takes a long time to render, uh, to render VFX or uh, animation. And generally on set, you have fairly modest connectivity. So those are the, the bounding box rules that we're going to work in for uh, asset management. Um, and if you look high level, this is super simplified. This is how assets flow through production. You have dailies that are generated, sent to editorial, and then editorial becomes sort of the choke point for sending out and managing assets to all the other facilities. Um, so th those are the, the core constraints for assets. Um, when, it talks to op when, when it comes to operations, uh, I think it's helpful to look back in time. And uh, one of the interesting things is, is to look at how pictures were made um, uh, in the 1920s, for example. And this is, a, this is a set from the 1920s, really early in the motion picture industry. Uh, and you'll notice there's a director, there's a, a camera person, there's talent, um, there's crew, and there's a set. And if you go forward to the 80s, you have uh, a director, you have talent, you have crew, you have a set. And then in 2013, I mean, if you, if you squint and you forget there's an LED screen or an LCD screen there, uh, it kind of is the same. And so really what we're talking about is that for roughly 120 years, the operations behind filmmaking, uh, behind motion pictures, is somewhat unchanged. The technology certainly has undergone profound changes, but at least we know that there's a stable set of operations that happen. And if we can slice into that, then we can start to uh, do things with assets without interrupting creativity and being totally transparent to, uh, to the creators. So those are fundamentals for assets and operations. Um, and those fundamentals, when it comes to traditional, uh, how these sorts of shows are traditionally created, um, has led to what, what I would hypothesize is sort of services driving infrastructure. And, and what you have here is you have those teams of operators. You have the, the director, you have the editor, you have the DI facility, you have the VFX facility, and they all have their own infrastructure. They all have their own tools. And those tools are hyper-optimized towards that creative task. And creators love the tools that they use because it's hard to learn these tools. Anybody that's used Maya, Final Cut Pro, Avid, um, knows that once you get really good at it, it becomes like uh, almost uh, invisible to you, and, and you're just operating within a creative space. But if you've never used it before, it's just <coughs> brutal to get to get started. Um, so, so you have hyper-focused tools for creators in each of these sections, but those are all tied together with uh, with really nothing other than suitcases, LTOs, hard drives. There's really no central infrastructure for for productions. And it's not an exaggeration either. This is an archive that we got two weeks ago. So I would love to say that Netflix is great. We've solved this, but we're not even close. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll get there eventually. But this happens all the time. This isn't, this isn't a unique case either. So some of the things that are unique to us as we, as we go to, to tackle uh, building infrastructure and asset management for productions. Um, we have essentially free compute. There's a, a tech uh, paper on our blog that talks about our internal spot market. Essentially, uh, we have a trough of reserved instances um, that is free for us to address. They exist in case we need to spike uh, to cover, uh, to cover uh, demand that we didn't predict. Um, so we get basically free compute. We can operate within that uh, very, very large trough. Uh, we have very cheap storage. Economies of scale works in our favor. Uh, so with 
uh, with our cloud providers. We have extremely, extremely cheap storage. We have very fast networking. Our Open, Con our open Connect CDN uh, is global. In North America, we do about a third of, of the downstream internet traffic during peak, uh, peak viewing hours. So uh, we have a lot of experience building out network. We also have a shared tech stack from studio to product, and I, I don't think you can overemphasize that. Um, a lot of studios, just out of, out of the natural growth of business, studios have been around for decades and decades and are super successful. Naturally, you have many different business units that grow within those, those studios, and, and as a result of that, you don't really have any sort of unified tech stack. We're able to leverage everything that Netflix has built for the service, uh, everything we've built for the content platform, and we can take that back um, all the way to the camera. So our, our approach is, is flipping the equation. Um, and what we've been doing for the last year or so is starting by building core infrastructure uh, and using that to drive services. And what I mean by that is we have a lot of services that we've built over time for the content platform or for the service itself. Um, that are great, that are scaled. Um, so things like a digital asset management system, authentication, workflow, uh, which by the way, uh, we call it Conductor. We've open sourced it. Um, that's our workflow engine. Uh, we have encoding and rendering at tremendous scale, playback services and workforce management. All of these things either existed um, or uh, were in, in um, some, some state of being created when we went to, to start down the path of building tools for the studio. Uh, and so what that allows us to do by having that core infrastructure is we can quickly recompose it uh, and create these different workflows. Um, and, and each of these boxes on the top, that doesn't necessarily mean that's something we're building from scratch. Uh, we use all of the major dailies review platforms, all of the major VFX tracking platforms. We have a mishmash of different tools across all of our productions. We are never gonna go to, uh, to a David Fincher, for example, and tell him he can't use PICS. Uh, so um, we're very practical. What we want to do is we want to be collecting data. That's our focus. And so we want to enable ourselves to have faster integrations and build faster tools uh, to meet uh, the demand of productions going forward. Um, so I talked a little bit about how this is a lot of new space for us, how we have some core challenges. Really those core challenges are all around learning and we have to set ourselves up to learn as, as quickly as possible. And I think that, that this approach hopefully does that. Um, so kind of a, a reflection of, of all the things that we've talked about, um, having a core infrastructure, having stable uh, operations. What it's allowed us to do is, is for example, we, we worked with um, Photochem and Colorfront to get API integrations. Uh, uh, that means that we're, we're uh, built into about 80% of the CART technology that's used to process dailies on set or ne near set. Uh, so an operator who would be sitting at that station, processing video, uh, sending, proxies or raw data to Netflix is one extra button click on top of what they would normally do to process and send dailies. So again, virtually transparent, the operator isn't impacted at all. Uh, and, and certainly productions uh, don't even have to know that this is happening if they don't want to. Um, so very quickly, we're able to get out of the gate with an API integration to start uh, getting data straight from the set. And so what that means in practice is um, for a few of our titles, some I can't mention, but some really big titles for us. Um, I don't know how frequently this has happened uh, elsewhere, but I think we're one of the first studios ever to be taking delivery of, of raw assets as it's being produced on set. Uh, so for both of these shows, for example, and, and a few other others that aren't up here, uh, every day or a couple times a day during shooting, we're actually taking delivery of uh, metadata, proxies, and raw assets um, directly to the cloud. And what that allows us to do is introduce uh, features that um, allow downstream teams to then pick up those assets and start working earlier and earlier in the process. So features like generic sharing where you can, where our teams that are responsible for creating motion billboards, for example, as soon as a, a cut is locked, can go and grab that cut and start cutting a, a trailer or a promo. Uh, generic sharing is not really where we want to go, though. We want most of the stuff to be driven through workflows. Uh, and so I think the way we get there is, uh, you know, one example, um, we're building a, a tool for editorial to review uh, cuts directly in Content Hub, share those cuts with other uh, people on the creative team, uh, and then click a button and release those cuts to the studio. 
and then we can drive through, uh, through automation um, the programmatic asset of those access of those assets to other downstream teams like localization, QC, um, marketing, uh, so on and so forth. So we really think that now that we can move quickly, that we have this core infrastructure, we start experimenting with these types of tools, which allow us to drive uh, a lot of a lot of efficiency to the studio. Hopefully, make the experience of creating uh, content really exciting with Netflix because we're able to leverage. All of the technology, all of the technology we've built for our service, um, and do it hopefully in a in a way that doesn't require suitcases full of hard drives. Um, so some some core principles that we landed on uh, start with shared infrastructure if you can, um, and ideally it's great if you can work back from fulfillment because a lot of the needs are are very very close between fulfillment and and uh, and production. Uh, getting access to assets earlier is really really critical. Uh, we started working our way backward from distribution to um, the camera, and so our first tool that we released was Archive, because we had a bunch of shows that were wrapped and needed to be archived. Uh, it takes about four months for us to archive a show uh, that we're trying to archive after it has wrapped. Everybody's moved on from those uh, productions. No one wants to think about them anymore, and if you go and you ask them what a certain file is, uh, you might not get a very good answer. Um, so if we can get out of that business entirely and just get access to assets day and date with when they're produced, we learn more about those assets, uh, and then archival just goes away and it becomes an automated process that happens after, after a show is wrapped. Um, and we want to continue driving data uh, all the way back to the camera and all the way to the product. Um, and so that, that's for a couple of purposes. One is so that we could learn uh, about where productions are challenged, how we can better our products. Uh, do we need to focus on better network infrastructure? Do we need uh, lower latency transfers, so on and so forth? We'll only learn that through data. Uh, and we, we have to be able to build quickly and learn from that. The other purpose is just to, to better inform our knowledge about titles. The content platform, our goal is to have the deepest uh, uh, database of knowledge about um, titles in the world. Uh, and I think that moving that data all the way back to the camera is really interesting. And so, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the sort of ideal flow of assets throughout a production. Really what, what our focus is, is not just on individual productions uh, and getting those, those productions uh, to have good systems, but doing that with an eye on how do we scale our product teams. Teams like marketing, our enhanced content team is the team that's responsible for tagging and creating trailers uh, and motion billboards and other promos and our localization team. So we have our eye firmly on um, the product and also on studio, of course. So with that, uh, any questions?